Well, hello, hearth and homies. Welcome to the challenge of the Yukon, volume five. Yeah, the challenge of the Yukon first hit the airwaves January 3rd, 1939. It would continue until 1955, and in that year, it would also move to television under the name Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. Of course, in 1950, the name of the radio show would be changed from Challenge of the Yukon to Sergeant Preston of the Yukon as well. But this show started after the success of The Lone Ranger and The Green Hornet. Radio station WXYZ's owner, George W. Trendle was looking for another adventure show, but this time he wanted the dog to be the hero. Now at this same time, Zane Grey had a couple books out that featured Sergeant King, the Royal Canadian Mounted Policeman. And also in the early 20s, another popular character was Renfrew of the Mounted Police, which launched a radio series that started in 1936. Actually, I've got a couple of those on the channel here. You can check up here and I'll put a link to that playlist as well. Challenge of the Yukon ran locally until 1947. Then Quaker Oats became a sponsor and it was picked up nationally. It ran on ABC until 1949 and then was picked up by the Mutual Broadcasting System from January 1950 till the end of the show on June 9th, 1955. Fran Stryker, who also wrote much of the Lone Ranger and Green Hornet scripts, was the main writer for this show. <laughs> and I've always just enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun. So I think you'll like it too. So to me, usually any George W. Trendle, Fran Stryker story are a, a lot of fun. Now we've also taken this classic old time radio show and paired it with videos of beautiful scenery to give you a unique old time radio viewing experience. So welcome to the visual radio. So get comfortable, grab a cup of tea or coffee and sit back and relax. There's Sergeant Preston, Yukon King in Challenge of the Yukon. And as always, thanks for tuning in. The challenge of the Yukon. Hunting! On you The Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog king met that challenge, and justice ruled triumphant. <laughs> It was midwinter, and in the library of the large house in New York City, two men were talking. Wallace Peters stood with his back to the fireplace, his fists clenched deep in the pockets of his coat. In front of him, Alfred Frank sat quietly, his fleshy face appearing both satisfied and sympathetic. It was the shock that killed her. Now, Wally, you shouldn't take this too hard. After all, you have your son to think of. You made sure Mary heard about it, too. I'm sorry. It was a slip of the tongue. You know how much I thought of her. Well, I would have spared her every possible worry. I could have kept my tongue out after I said it, Wally, believe me. Too bad you didn't. Now, wait a minute, old man. You're not yourself. I know all this has been a blow to you, but... Yes, you're right. It has been a blow to me. One after the other. First, the business crashing... Crashing because I took your advice about investments. Everyone can make mistakes. I lost money myself. It was bad judgment and... Well, you didn't have to accept my advice. But I did. I accepted it because I trusted you. You've always known I had no business head. You knew that in college. I'm ruined. Ruined, you hear? Lost everything that could be written on the black side of the books. You get back on your feet. Borrow some cash. No, no. What I lost was my own. I'm down, but I'm not mortgaged. But that's business, man. Be sensible. You take a loss once, you make it up the next time. It's all in the game. Not in my game, it isn't. I'm through. I've got sense enough to see it. Sense enough to see a lot of other things I never thought of before. Oh? Uh. Yes, oh. I'm going to give this to you straight, Al. Because I'm not the kind that can say one thing and think another. You killed my wife. <laughs> What? You killed her just as surely as if you'd pushed her down those steps. You're out of your mind. Out of my mind. You were out of your mind, weren't you, when you said that even the house would have to go up for sale? Everything Mary lived for. Everything that had any meaning for her. My friend. My friend who wasn't content to ruin me. Oh, he had to make sure I'd lose everything. Everything. I won't listen to you, Warren. You better get some rest. You feel better tomorrow. You'll listen to me, all right. 
Because once I've got this off my mind, so far as I'm concerned, you'll never have to listen to me again. You'll be sorry for this. Yeah, I can see it all now. When we were both courting her, you were as much in love with her as I was, weren't you? Yes, I guess I was. Yeah, sure you were. But she didn't marry you. She married me. I wasn't good enough for her. I knew it. She was so far above me, I didn't think I stood a chance. You were in her class, Al. You with all the right clubs. You with a pedigree that goes back to the Mayflower. And all the money of Wall Street behind you. What are you driving at? Just this. I tried to make her happy. I tried to do everything she wanted me to. I was doing all right. Except for you. Except that you never forgave her for marrying me instead of you. You're crazy. Oh, no, I'm not crazy. You decided you'd take away everything that was important to Mary. Money. And all the things she was used to having. Sure, you advised me. Sure, you lost money, too. You could afford to lose a couple of hundred thousand, but I couldn't. You weren't content to ruin me. Oh, you had to tell her. You had to watch the expressions on her face. You had to watch her turn pale, lose her footing, and reach out for something to save her, only to fall headlong... You're going too far, Wally. I never want to see you again. Get out of this house. Go on, get out. I'll remember this. I hope you'll never forget it. I won't. And believe me, I'll see to it that you never do either. Arranging for his sister to take care of the baby, Wallace Peters left New York as the house in the city was posted for sale. He had an immeasurable sense of loss that was with him no matter where he went or what he did. His skin burned and shriveled with the heat and malaria of the tropics. In waterfront saloons in Singapore or the Argentine, he had the appearance of countless other drifters, purposeless and weary. And then, one day, shortly after the news of the discovery of gold and what was North America's last frontier, Alfred Pink, grown fat and heavy-jowled, sat talking in his office to the young man who was his secretary. You can uh, start getting the luggage together immediately. Everything will need. Listen, that flyer you took in South America was all right. Down there, we just had to put up with heat and bugs. I don't know anything about this place except that it's cold and a death trap for men who aren't used to the climate. It might be a death trap for other men, but it'll never be one for me. Oh, well, you can send somebody else. Buddy, to... you are going with me. I may need you, you understand. You and I appreciate each other's methods. Yeah, no but I... No buts about it either. I have a reason for going to the Yukon. A good one. In a way, it's a personal score I want to settle. How do you mean? You've heard me speak about Wally Peters. Peters? Well, sure. Haven't I been checking up on every move he's made these last 15 years? I got a very interesting letter this morning... Peters is in the Yukon. I never did know why you wanted to keep track of him. Wally's found himself as rich a piece of property as any man has ever uncovered. Richer, Marty, than you can imagine. Lucky, huh? That all depends on what you call luck. It'll be bad luck for him. Good for us. As long as he went the way of a bum, I let him alone. But now, now it's different. I want that gold mine. I'm going to get it. Personally. It was months later. And in the small cabin that withstood the icy blasts of wind whipping outside it, Wally Peters slumped in a chair looking bitterly at the two men standing in front of him. His face was bruised and swollen. His hands were tied, the rope cutting his wrist. <laughs> That's enough, Marty. Have you had enough, my friend? I've met a lot of men who are rotten. But you aren't worth the rat powder it take to kill you. Those are pretty strong words, Wally. And foolish ones for a man in your position. Too bad you don't look at this the way I do. Your name on the dotted line is all I want. You'll never get it. All right, Marty. Oh. You said this country was a death trap, Marty. 
So it will be for our friend here. Pick him up and put him on the sled. We'll throw him off along the trail, and when he's found, it'll look like an accident. Several hours had passed when Sergeant Preston halted his dogs beside the figure on the trail. The Mountie revived Wally Peters and listened to the story the man told. Quietly, the great dog King stood close to his master. Well, that's the story, Sergeant. They're at the cabin now. You've got to get back to town. Oh, I, I must stop, Al. He'd be here to kill us both if he knew you found me. Easy now. You need rest. How long had he kept you a prisoner? Three days. Sergeant, there's no time to waste. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put you on the sled. Here, let me help you. You go back to town. I have my snowshoes. I can make them in a couple of hours. But, but you... <clears throat> Uh, I'll go to the cabin and see this man, Alfred Frank. Your dogs, I won't be able to manage them. King will lead them. And that way, I'll be sure you'll make it to town safely. Be careful. Don't worry. Sergeant Preston's approach to the cabin had been watched. And as he stood talking to Alfred Frank... The Mountie was unaware of the man standing in the shadows behind him. A visit from a mounted policeman who had him a little surprised. Yes, I imagine you are. You're Alfred Frank? That's right, Sergeant. Mr. Frank, I'll come right to the point. I just found Wally Peters on the trail about a mile from the cabin. Wally Peters? Well, I didn't... Is uh, he all right? He was able to talk, if that's what you're wondering. Oh, I see. Needless to say, I'll have to put you under arrest for attempted murder. If I hadn't found him when I did, he would have died of exposure. There must be some mistake. No, no mistake. This is his cabin. You're occupying it. Everything is pretty much as he said it was. Now, where's the other man he spoke of? What is? You pet out! Uh, what'll we do, Al? Get rid of him? I don't know. Wait till I have a chance to talk to him. When the Mountie regained consciousness, he'd been disarmed. Marty stood beside him holding a gun menacingly while Al Frank slowly paced the floor. Do you see, Sergeant, that's how it is. I'll meet any price you ask to uh, forget this unfortunate occurrence. You've bought your way out of situations before, I take it. Well, more or less. What do you say? You can't bribe me, Frank. Yeah. The hell warm. Hmm? What's that, Al? The motto of the Northwest Mounted Police. Maintain the right. You'll never make any money on the force, Sergeant. A man with your ability and intelligence should travel with any amount of wealth at his fingertips. You're hardly in a position to have much choice, you know. I told you before, you can't bribe me. And you can't scare me either. It's my duty to take you in. Mm, a foolish attitude to take. Well, I did my best anyway. That uh, water is boiling, Marty. I'll take the gun. You get some tea ready. Uh, the only pan I see here is this wide one. All right, use that. You two men aren't used to the rugged life, hmm? Need any help? He can manage. The Marty sat silently, his eyes and the man awkwardly making tea. At the same time, he was conscious of every move Al Frank made. The man holding the gun stood beside him, a deep frown on his face. Preston wondered if Wally Peters had made it back to town. He knew his dogs would carry him safely, but would Peters be able to tell what had happened when he got there? Would Peters be able to send help? Or would he assume Preston was all right? Carefully, Marty Renwick carried the pan of tea to the wooden table. In the corner of his eye, the policeman watched Al Frank, and then casually rose from his chair. I'd like a drink of that tea, if you don't mind. Sure. I'll have some myself. As Sergeant Preston turned to reach for a cup, apparently by accident, his arm bumped the hand holding the gun. And as Al Frank swayed for a moment, his hand almost touching the pan of tea, he dropped the revolver. <laughs> the steaming tea splashed. Oh, my hand, you fool! The tea burned my hand. I'm sorry. What the gun? Get the gun. Yeah, sure. It splashed and burned your hand, so you want me to reach in and pull then it get out. Get the gun from my Mackinac. Don't stand there. Uh, stay where you are, Marty. You're in a good spot to stop what they call a haymaker. Uh, show you. Uh, 
King, uh, King, old boy. Need any help, Sergeant? Uh, looks like you got those two pretty much where you want them. Sam, how'd you get here? Sure covered both of you. All right, and I've got that gun from your Mackinac, Mr. Frank. Put the handcuffs on him, Sam. Yeah. You law and order commissioner certainly managed to show up at the right time. <laughs> we managed to show up. Why, consign it, Sergeant. That there dog of yours wouldn't give me no peace till I harnessed up the dogs and set out here with him leading the way. You all right, Sergeant? Wally, I thought I told you to go into Three Forks and stay there. I couldn't stay there knowing you were here with that, that rat. I wouldn't trust him any further than I could throw him. Well, it looks like the score's even now, Al. All right. You win. I win. You couldn't let me alone, could you? You heard I struck it rich, that my son and I would have more money than I ever lost. So you couldn't rest. You started this, and the sergeant here finished it. It seems that you are finished, too. In le droit. Right has been maintained. <laughs> yes, King. The case is closed. <laughs> These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit, and all characters, names, places, and incidents used are fictitious. They're sent to you each week at the same time. Jack McCarthy speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of Yukon. I'm King! I'm you Husky! The Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog king met that challenge, and justice ruled triumphant. As the steamer City of Seattle nosed its way through the Lynn Canal, its engines straining, two young men isolated themselves from the crowd that swarmed the decks, both of them looking toward the horizon beyond them. Wonder how soon we'll sight it. Won't be long now. What Ferguson says is true. There's a man that knows the Yukon, Paul. Boy, we were mighty lucky to bump into him. Huh. Why, what's wrong? Wrong? Nothing's wrong, exactly. Except that I don't trust that fellow. Well, I don't know why not. The advice he gave us about what kind of an outfit to buy will sure come in handy. He says almost all Chichacos, well, that's what they call greenhorns in this country, load themselves down with more stuff than they can use. Yeah? Another thing, he knows the trails. If he knows so much about the Yukon, why didn't he stay up there? Or if he left, how come he got back to the States broke? Well, he says he got kind of homesick. Funny thing, though. He was telling me this morning that once you've lived up north, it, it gets in your blood. That's why he's going back. Listen, John. So it's all right with me who you're friendly with. That's none of my business. But don't say anything to him about the map. Oh, or have you? Me? Oh, now, listen, I wouldn't Just say so anything. you don't. This Pete Ferguson might be all right. I just don't trust him, and I don't like his looks. And what's more... Hmm. Speak of the devil. Hello there. Uh, How soon will we sight Alaska? Oh, you're pretty anxious, ain't you? Well, I don't blame you. You'll sight Skagway any minute now. Good. That suits me fine. Yeah. I guess you two are going to the Yukon for the same reason everybody else does, huh? <laughs> well, I wish you luck. Thanks. I hope we won't need it, Mr. Ferguson. Paul Martin and John Rogers wasted little time trying to get organized for the journey that was ahead of them. Chachacos they were, but unlike the many thousands of men and women who milled about, striking out indiscriminately to search for gold or following rumors, Paul Martin and his friend knew where they were going. Their problem was how to get there. Behind them, Skagway loomed, a sprawling boom town become suddenly important as the gateway to the gold fields. To Pete Ferguson, it was also a gateway, a gateway to easy riches. In one of the many garish saloons scattered through town, 
He held a hurried conference with the short, stocky man who had met him at the dock. So far, I don't make no sense out of anything you said, Pete. I thought you and me was staying here in Alaska. Half the trouble we had with the Mounties. You sure don't expect to go back to the Yukon, do you? Now listen, Whitey. This is too good to pass up. So we had trouble with the Mounties. We got out of their territory all right, didn't we? By the skin of our teeth, we did. Well, a miss is as good as a mile. They won't be expecting us back up there. All we got to do is keep out of their way. These two young fellas don't know the country, say. Yeah, but what... Shut up and let me finish, will you? I got pretty friendly with one of them on the boat. The other's kind of, uh, well, keeps more to himself. But what I got from this Rogers fella makes me sure it'll be a cinch. <laughs> They've got a map. Well, how do you know it means anything? You think I'd be fool enough to take a chance on it unless I knew? They've got something up their sleeve, and I'm getting in on it. Thought you might be willing to take a chance, Whitey. Of course, if you're not interested in splitting whatever there is in I it... I didn't well... say that. I just wanted to make sure you wasn't starting off on a wild goose chase. <laughs> I thought you'd come around. Now, listen. They're greenhorns, see. They're bound to leave a trail plain enough for a blind man to follow. All we got to do is trail them. Keep them in sight. And then... <laughs> who knows? At first, the two Chachacos had only blistered feet and a dull weariness to reward them at the end of each day. The warm, dry, westerly Chinook wind had swept across the Yukon, bringing vegetation to the land that had been snowbound and ice imprisoned during the winter months. But though their endurance increased with every day spent on the trail, both Paul Martin and John Rogers complained constantly of the mosquitoes that infested the country. Uh, ah, these things are driving me crazy. For every one you kill, there's a thousand more of them. Nothing you can do about them, as far as I can see. I'm telling you, Paul, I could put up with a cold. I can stand being hungry and walking my feet off. But these mosquitoes must have been dreamed up by the devil himself to drive a man daft. When we make camp for the night, maybe the smoke from the campfire will drive them away. Drive them away? <laughs> you ask me, it just shows them where we are. <clears throat> well, we ought to sight the three pine trees tomorrow. That's just what I figure. I'm glad this map was so detailed, John. Come on, let's see if we can't make better time. I'm going this. It was several days later. The two partners had located the spot designated on the map as the source of a rich gold vein. It was a stretch of flat, dimpled land, and they set to work immediately. Meanwhile, several miles away from where they camped, Pete Ferguson and Whitey McLaughlin stood thoughtfully beside a wide, clear stream. Well, I'll hand it to you, Pete. You had the right idea. I saw them lifting some gold this morning. And from where I was, it looked like the real thing. Yeah. You want me to head back and beat them to filing papers? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You're going to stand here and watch them lift carloads of the stuff before you do anything about it? Yeah, jumping that claim would be risky. Especially considering the fact we don't want any trouble with the police. So far, they don't know we're up here. But Martin and Rogers wouldn't stand around and just keep their mouths shut while we moved in on the pay dirt. Uh, well, yeah, but we didn't come up here just to look at the scenery, Pete. Listen, Whitey, you might have brains, only i never seen you use them. There's other ways of getting those two to move out of here. Like what? I've kept pretty close tab on them. I've come close enough to their camps along the trail back there to be able to hear them talk, see? And what bothers them most is mosquitoes. Oh, what are you doing, talking in riddles? Mosquitoes. What's mosquitoes got to do they with They got a lot to do with us. More than once, Rogers has wanted to turn back because of them. Yeah. Well, there ain't no picnic at that. But then, there shouldn't be any of them over there where they're camped now. No reason why there can't be. Huh? See that dam there in the stream? Oh, yeah. So we break up the dam, and the water runs down toward their camp. It'd be a breeding place for mosquitoes. That's an idea. Maybe if they'd be bad enough, 
They'd clear out of here till the cold spell. Sure. <laughs> Come on, let's get the word. Sergeant Preston halted his dogs where the two partners had their camp. He found the two young men involved in a bitter argument. I told him he could stay here if he wanted to, Sergeant. But I'm fed up. We've come a long way and we've worked hard. And I'm not tossing it over just because he can't take a few mosquitoes. A few mosquitoes? The place is living with them. When we first got here, it wasn't so bad. But the other morning we woke up and the claim was flooded. We never know when we get up whether we'll be flooded out or if the ground will just be soggy from the day before. And it's flooded now. The dam must have broken upstream. But it should be... What do you say about one day the water overruns your campsite and the next it and doesn't... And the next there might not be any. The Mountie frowned as he listened to the strange story the two young prospectors told. Then, after getting John Rogers' promise that he'd remain in camp for a few more days, Sergeant Preston turned his dog pull travois back toward the trail, preparing to follow the stream. A short time later, with the great dog King standing close to his master, the Mountie stood looking at the wide stream in front of him. His eyes followed the small animal swimming upstream in what appeared to be a migration. The policeman wondered what would cause the beavers to desert what had been home to them. That's odd. There must be some reason. What is it, fellow? Oh, a beaver. Looks like he stopped a bullet. Why would anyone kill one of these animals and not bother skinning them for the fur? It... Why, there are dozens of them here. Somebody's been picking them off with rifles. And here's some shells. Ah, come on, fella. This is where we start trying to find the answers to this puzzle. With a great dog, King, leading his team, Sergeant Preston drove slowly through the timber, watching for signs of the man or men responsible for killing the beavers. The dog soon caught the scent of two men, and in his eagerness, accelerated the pace. <laughs> Meanwhile, Pete Ferguson and Whitey McLaughlin sat in their camp eating cold rations, since they didn't dare risk making a campfire. Well, I'll sure be glad when them two clear out of here. When I eat beans, I like them cooked. Well, don't worry, Give them another day or so. They're fighting about it now. Mosquitoes won't leave them alone. Well, we're kind of getting a share of them ourselves. Yeah, they're not as bad over here. Besides, we're used to them. I got close to the camp last night, and believe me, the pests are there in swarm. Hey, what's that? Somebody coming. Wait till I get that rifle. Never mind reaching for that rifle. Hey, Pete, it's a Mountie. I didn't know there was any around. Why didn't you? Well, this is quite a surprise. Out of curiosity, I followed a trail, not knowing whose it was. I never expected to find you two. Now listen, Marty, we ain't done nothing. We're just peaceful prospectors. There's we... no use talking, Whitey. You managed to get out of the territory last year after those bank robberies. Pete, you lame brain fool. I should have known better than take you up on that crazy idea of yours. Follow them, too. Drive them away from the claim. Yeah, you drove us straight to jail. All right, Marty. You win. And after hearing what Whitey just said... I think before I take you back to town, we'll make one stop. Get the dogs up, King. When John Rogers saw Sergeant Preston's two prisoners, his eyes widened with surprise. There was little resemblance in the surly face of Pete Ferguson to the same man who'd been so affable and helpful when the two had met on the steamer city of Seattle. These men are responsible for the mosquitoes that have been swarming around your camp. How do you mean, Sergeant? There's a beaver dam farther upstream. Now, they broke the dam so that this ground would be flooded. Shallow water was a perfect breeding place for mosquitoes. But each time they broke the dam, the beavers rebuilt it. So they killed some of the beavers. And that's where they made the mistake. Mistake? Yes. Because it was the dead beavers that aroused my curiosity. I followed their trail. Well, I'll be... I dog... told you you never should have trusted Ferguson. You told him about the map, I guess. Well, I... Well, we've got nothing to worry about now. The sergeant's arrested them. Sure, we got nothing to worry about. Mosquitoes are still here. Look at them. All over my clothes. I don't think they'll be troubling you too long, Paul. Of course, you'll never be free of them this season, but... The beavers swam upstream, 
And they'll build another dam which will divert the water. And as soon as this ground dries up, you'll have fewer mosquitoes. It'll be small relief. Oh, any relief will... from the pests can't be sneezed at. Sergeant, we'll never be able to thank you. Well, I've got my men, and you'll be free to work your claim. Seems like that evens up the score. Oh, there's uh, just one thing, John. What's that, Sergeant? The next time you meet a stranger who's very much interested in your business affairs, I think you better use a little discretion. <laughs> Maybe next time you'll be plagued with bees instead of mosquitoes. <laughs> See, I told you. Maybe from now on you'll keep your mouth shut. Sure. And when we get to town, I'll buy you a drink on it. Well, Mr. Ferguson, I wish you a pleasant journey. It's a one-way journey for him. <laughs> yes, fella? The case is closed. These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit, and all characters, names, places, and incidents used are fictitious. They are sent to you each week at the same time. Jack McCarthy speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. On, King! On, you husky! The Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, King, met that challenge. And justice ruled triumphant. The Wheel of Fortune Saloon in Cypress City was the most elaborate gambling place in the Yukon. Where most of the saloons and cafes were hurriedly thrown together barns, the Wheel of Fortune was different. It was different because Duke Mendoza, the small, elegantly dressed gambler who owned half of it, brought to the last and greatest North American frontier some of the lavishness that had made San Francisco's gambling halls famous. There was a luxury about the solid mahogany bar and the drapes hanging in the long room that pleased Mendoza. He smiled to himself as he toyed with his watch chain, the diamond on his well-cared-for hands glittering in the light. With his partner, he stood watching the installation of a new roulette wheel. <laughs> when the miners get a look at this tonight, they'll be throwing their gold at us, Sam. I still think you shouldn't have bought it. We laid out too much cash for a duke. Don't forget, we're in business to make money. What's wrong with you? Haven't you been getting more out of it than you ever put into the place? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm not kicking about that, but... This wheel isn't an ordinary one. What do you mean? We'll make a thousand times out of it what we put out to buy it. Well, maybe we didn't need it. We're getting along. But anyone can do that up here. These miners that spend all their time working their diggings get so hard up for diversion, they begin talking to themselves. When they get to town, the first place they head for is a saloon. <laughs> oh, I ain't complaining that business is bad. A lot more dust passes through our hands than we'd ever see if we was to spend our time digging for it like the suckers that throw it away in here every night. That's just what I mean. And that's why I want to make the Wheel of Fortune the natural spot for them to head for when they come in. <laughs> eh, the place has got class, Sam. You don't see men fighting to get into the Golden Nugget, do you? <laughs> no. We do three times the business McLaughlin does in that saloon of his. And I'll give the devil his due, Duke. You're the one that's responsible for it. So, give me credit for having a reason to make an investment like this. Investment? I don't get you. I'll show you what I mean. All right, boys, that's fine. Just leave it like that. Yeah, it sure looks interesting, Duke. Well, then come in tonight and play it, Charlie. It's an easy way to double your money. Yeah, well, mind it that. Well, see you later. Sure, sure. Here you are, Sam. 
See this gadget under here? Uh Uh-uh. I should have known you wouldn't get a straight piece of merchandise. Oh, then you know how this works, huh? Sure. I seen one like that in Frisco when I worked at the Double Eagle. The magnet does the trick. And the twist of the wrist under the table takes care of the rest. Like I said, this thing will pay for itself a thousand times over. (laughs) I should have known better to argue with you in the first place, I guess. Yeah, I know how this game gets you. It looks like an easy one to beat. That's the beauty of it, Sam. We should have had a roulette wheel a long time ago. It's the first one in the Yukon. And by the time other places get around to installing them, the novelty will have worn off. (laughs) We'll have a crowded house tonight, and I guarantee we'll net more dust than we ever have before. Meantime, at a small cabin several miles north of Cypress City, Sergeant Preston sat talking to Matt and Paul Wilson. The Mountie smiled to himself as he thought of the difference in the temperaments of the two brothers, both of whom he'd known since their arrival in the Yukon several months earlier. Well, I've never claimed to have any psychic powers, but I think you two will hit pay dirt here. I don't think it's so till I know. We've already uncovered enough gold to prove we were right. But we'll be hitting the real thing any time now. Now, I wish you all the luck in the world. <coughs> What's your hurry? You don't have to hit the trail right away, do you? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Have to be in Cypress City today, and I'd like to get an early start. I have to go in for some supplies. How about waiting a few minutes, and I'll make the trip with you? It isn't often that I can have company on my way in. Yeah, that'd be fine. Good. I'll be with you in a few minutes. I'll bring in some of that wood before I leave, Paul, and you won't have to bother with it while I'm gone. Suits me. Be right back, Sergeant. You know, Matt's the best brother anyone could have, Sergeant. Well, then why the frown? You say that as if you were worried about him. Worried? Well, I guess I was thinking about what'll happen as soon as he gets into town. What's that? I'm not a gambling man myself, but I'd lay you two to one. He'll be playing poker in some saloon not 15 minutes after he gets in. Well, he likes to talk to other prospectors and seems the best place to find them is around poker tables. No, that's not it. He's got this thing in his blood. And you can't talk him out of it. Every time he goes into a poker game, he expects to come out with his money tripled. The fact that he doesn't, he chalks up to luck. But I suppose he enjoys it. Only I sure hope he doesn't throw his shirt in one of these days. Here you are, Paul. Thanks. Now, if you're ready, Sergeant, let's get started. (laughs) Right. Looks like King's kind of anxious to get back on the trail again. He always resents being indoors. Unless there's something around to arouse his curiosity. Yeah, I guess he puts up with the warmth of the cabin just to be near you. Now, stop in again the next time you get up this way. I will, Paul. And thanks for putting us up for the night. I'll mention it. While you're in town, I'll keep working at the mine, Matt. Who knows? Maybe I'll strike it. (laughs) Boy, if you do, you sure better burn the wind getting into town to tell me about it. We must sound like a couple of kids to you, Sergeant, with a special Christmas package we want to open together. Well, that's the way we feel about the mine. Everything we've done on it, we've done together. And when we strike, it's going to be big. In Cypress City, several hours later, Sergeant Preston covered his duties with the great dog King walking close at his heels. As the Mountie went about the settlement, no detail was too small to escape his notice. He walked with the slow, deliberate stride of a man who'd spent long periods of time on the trail. The snow crunched noisily beneath his boots. And as he turned toward the Wheel of Fortune saloon, he saw Matt Wilson going through the door ahead of him. Neither Matt nor the policeman had any way of knowing that even then, at the small cabin north of the city, Paul stood staring almost unbelievingly at the gold he held in his hand. I've struck it. I've struck the vein. I never thought I would when I told Matt. Oh, wait till he hears this. Burn the wind, he said. That's what I'm doing right now. And believe me, brother, we'll celebrate. (laughs) 
Sergeant Preston stood near the door of the Wheel of Fortune, his eyes on the men circling the roulette table, all of them staking fabulous amounts of precious dust on the small ivory ball spinning dizzily along the red and black numbers. There was a recklessness in the air, a recklessness that had already cleaned many a prospector's pocket of the dust he'd carried with him into the saloon. The policeman noticed the look of intense concentration on Matt Wilson's face as he leaned forward to place his chips. Sergeant Preston walked toward the table, Great Dog King silently following his master. Number 16 it is, Red. All right, gentlemen, place your bets. Place your bets. How's your luck, man? There. There it is on number four. Huh? Oh, 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 it's you, Sergeant. Well, my luck hasn't been so good this far. Well, I'll say it hasn't. That boy's loss just about every time he put the chip down. But for that matter, so did the rest of us. The house is making money, hmm? Oh, it's paid off a couple of times. Ready? Hey, look! Black number five. That's where I had my chips, Duke. Looks like you pay me. All right, Cole. Anyone have a chip on the line? No. Uh, too bad. Yeah, I should have put it on the line. What's wrong, son? You're running out of dust. Almost. Here goes the last of it. So far, I've just missed by one number every time. Preston stood not far from Duke Mendoza. As King looked about him, he moved restlessly seeking to get away from the heavy boots he had to constantly dodge. The man standing next to Mendoza shifted his position, and quickly King slipped under the table. The dog settled himself on the floor, prepared to wait until his master was ready to leave the crowded saloon. Duke, I'm fresh out of dust, but I've got half interest in one of the richest states in this part of the country. I'll lay my interest on number eight. Hey, now, wait a minute, kid. That's taking a pretty big chance. My luck will change, and I'll risk it. What about it, Duke? If I lose, you get half interest in the mine. If I win, you pay off 36 to 1. Ah, 36 to 1 on what amount? Let's say I've got $1,000 there. If I win, you pay me 36000 It's your gamble. All right. All right. From his vantage point on the floor, King saw the man's hand suddenly appear beneath the edge of the table. Like some disembodied, independent thing, it moved to where a long, slender stick lay on a narrow shelf. Curiously, King raised his head and watched the hand. As it moved, he moved, his nose touching it. Startled, Mendoza shoved King aside, his hand dropping the stick before contacting the magnet controlling the wheel. Hey, what the, what's down there? Down where? Under the table, you fool. I tell you when I start. What's like your payoff, Duke? There's the ball on number eight. You can pay me 36 to one. As Matt Wilson spoke, Duke Mendoza automatically raised his head. But the sentence he had uttered aroused the interest of the men around the table, and they stopped to discover the reason for his exclamation. Looking under the table, Sergeant Preston saw King lying close to Mendoza's feet with the stick clenched beneath his teeth. King, come here, boy. Let's see what you've got there. Uh, leave him alone, Sergeant. He, uh, <coughs> he meant no harm, I'm sure. But King, trained to instant obedience, was already out from beneath the table, his eyes searching Preston's face to discover whether in seizing the stick he had done something for which he'd be reprimanded. A stick, huh? Hey, what's that? I what got that like... some mistake, Sergeant. Now let's just forget it and go on with the play. Oh, no. No, I don't think there has been a mistake, Mendoza. Well, I've been watching the play here for quite a while. And so far, the house has paid out only small sums. I think I begin to understand why. What do you mean, Sergeant? Mendoza, I want to look at this table. Step back, men. Uh -huh. Just as I thought. This wheel is magnetized. Magnetized? You mean it's crooked? Yes. The stick king found under the table was used to manipulate the lodestone here. You see it? So that Mendoza could move it to any position and stop the wheel. Why, you dirty double-crossing sneak? I don't mind losing my money, but I sure as Jupiter don't aim to be cheated out of it. What's going on here, man? Paul. Well... I guess Sergeant Preston here just saved me from losing my half of the interest in the mine. In the mine? Yeah. I just laid it on the wheel here. It must have been an accident, Mendoza, but that ball stopped at number eight. You owe Matt $36,000. Well, I, uh... Well, I... I guess I'll pay off. You bet your life you do. That's a darn good thing for you it came off this way, Matt. Because the reason I came in was to tell you I struck oh, it. What? Yeah. Oh. And to think mm -hmm. I... 
Maybe this will prove to you that Mr. P.T. Barnum knew what he was talking about. You had a narrow escape, Matt. And as for you, Mendoza, if I come through town again and find your games crooked, you might as well get set to do a jail sentence. Then, after what these men have seen tonight, maybe they'll be more careful where they spend their money. <laughs> the great dog king looked at Preston. What the talk was about, he didn't understand. But as his master's eyes met his, he knew that in some strange way he'd pleased the man he loved with such blind devotion. This knowledge was enough for King, the wonder dog of the Yukon. Yes, fella. Thanks to you, everything's all right. These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit. And all characters, names, places, and incidents are fictitious. They are sent to you each week at this same time. Bob Height speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog king met that challenge and justice ruled triumphant. (laughs) Hankin City was a crowded, noisy, hurriedly constructed settlement of sprawling frame buildings to house the variegated population that had surged to the great north country, a land that held in its icy grasp Riches to quicken the imagination of any man who worshipped wealth. Saloons and cafes were always full. And until it closed, the general store and trading post was also full. Crowded with men who exchanged news while they bought supplies. In the small office in back of the general store, Clint Marsh stood talking to a heavy-set, beady-eyed man who turned away from a large desk and the ledgers he'd been working on. Listen, Lord. Maybe you think I got cold feet and I'm backing out on you. But that ain't why I'm telling you this. It's on the level. Go on. Finish what you were saying. And then I'll start talking. We've been getting along pretty good, the two of us. So far, we're in the clear. And that's where I'm staying. Maybe you've got a hankering to get your neck stretched, but not me. That all you got to say? That's all. Except that if you pull this job tonight with a red coat in town, you're pulling it alone, see? Oh, no. I'm pulling the job tonight, all right. But I'm not pulling it alone. Now you listen to me. We've been in the clear all this time. Not because of you, but because of me. Yeah, sure. Nobody would ever think that Mort Murdoch was tied up with the robberies. But they might... Not nothing. I've been smart enough to keep my tracks covered. And that's the way they're going to stay. You're bucking something you can't beat when you got a Mountie sitting in on the deal, Mort. I'm telling you, I know. Oh, trouble with you is the sight of that red coat makes you lose what little sense you got. So Preston's in town. And he's a smart Mountie, huh? Always gets his man, they say. He ain't missed on any count ever. Remember that. Well, that's because the men he was after were dumber than he was. I'm smarter than he is, Clint. And that scarlet coat doesn't scare me one bit. Why, I'll make a monkey out of him. You better stick around and watch me do it if you know what's good for you. Now, wait a minute. I don't want to have... You heard what I said. We'll work this just the same way we work the other ones. I know this town. I know the trails. Why, we'll pull a job right under his nose. (laughs) And then watch him while he knocks his head against a brick wall trying to figure it out. Well, you know where to wait for me. Now clear out of here and see that you're ready. It 
It was hours later. At an isolated stretch of land, one man stood as if waiting, his dog team standing as if they, too, were hesitating only for the command to mush. High above the snow-covered slope where they stood, the trail skirted a hillside, and it was toward this trail that the man looked. Here he comes now. Smash! Where's you, Husky? Smash! The man came into sight on the trail, his dogs calling forth every bit of pulling power in obedience to his command. Smash, you, Husky! Smash! He looked from the ribbon of trail stretching before him to where the dog team waited far below. Then, bracing himself momentarily, he gave one last command. Master, you must! Smash! And then he jumped rolling, turning, and sliding in the soft blanket of snow until he reached the bottom of the slope. I, I thought you'd never get here. I made it all right. Those dogs of yours ready? Ain't they always? Well, then, let's get back to town. I got the cash and some dust in my Mackinac. What about Preston? <laughs> that Mountie's going to be mighty surprised when he finds he's trailing a dog team without a driver. Bush, you huskies! Bush! A short time after the two men started back to town, Sergeant Preston, with the great dog King leading his team, approached and passed that point on the trail from where Mort Murdoch had jumped to roll down the slope and meet his confederate. The tracks cut in the snow by Murdoch's sled were sharp and clear. It was an easy task to follow them, and with King setting a fast pace for his dogs, the policeman soon sighted the driverless team still running along the trail. That's the sled, all right. Question is, what happened to the man who was driving it? On, King! On, you Malamutes! All right, fellow, we've got to stop those dogs. Ho, you huskies! Ho! 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 Ho, King! Ho, you Malamutes! Ho! Search the sled. See if I can find anything on it that'll... (laughs) Not a thing, fella. Not even carrying a pack. Well, we'll search the trail. Somewhere between here and town, our men left the sled. Might have been an accident. Someone may have stopped him. There's something odd about this. It's too pat. Almost as if it had been planned. (laughs) Come on, boy. We'll start back. It was late the next day when Sergeant Preston walked into Murdoch's trading post in Hankin City. A group of men in the store turned to question the Mountie as he strode toward them. Hi there, Sergeant. Hello, Les. How are you? Fine. Uh, we was just wondering how you made out. Following size murder? Well, I didn't get him. No uh, luck, huh, Sergeant? Oh, it isn't a question of luck, Mort. He gave us a slip along the trail. I backtracked, but it was too dark to be able to tell clearly just where he left his sled. I went back this morning. Any uh, footprints? Nope. I don't know. So I had a lot of American paper money in his cabin. Some dust, too. Seems like that was what he was murdered for. There's no doubt of it. Uh, you think he was killed by somebody in town? I don't know. You ought to know better than to ask questions, Mort. The sergeant's got a right to keep what he thinks under his hat. Well, whoever done it was sure crazy to take a chance while there's a mountain in town. That's my opinion. Yeah, you're right. Well, I don't envy him, Sergeant. <laughs> they say you fellas always get your man. Well, I guess it's about time to close up the post. See you over at the saloon later, boys. Several hours passed and Sergeant Preston walked along Hankin City's main street, with King following close at his heels. The town was shrouded in darkness, penetrated at intervals by the light of oil lamps spilling from windows to the snow. Suddenly, the Mountie paused. Beyond him was the oblong frame building that served as a bank. (laughs) Yes, fellow, I see him. Somebody's just come out of there, and he's heading for that sled. March, you husky! March! Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! Let him follow him. Come on, King. (laughs) 
On the trail a few minutes later, King, quick to sense the excitement of a chase, spurred Preston's dogs on, his teeth nipping the ears of any that slowed the team. It was because of his efforts that the policeman sighted the driverless pack of dogs a short distance beyond the point where Mort Murdoch had jumped from the trail, once again to meet his partner as he'd done before. This time, Preston took his dogs back at a walk, his eyes and King scanning the trail in front of them. That's twice it's happened. It's part of a plan. Either there's a hideout somewhere along here, or someone was waiting for him. The Mountie walked slowly along the trail. It was a little better than a ledge hewn in the hillside, with the light of the moon supplying illumination. <laughs> as his master walked dangerously near the edge of the trail, the great dog placed the weight of his body against the man as if to warn him. Preston turned, and the snow beneath the dog's feet gave way. Almost unconsciously, the man reached to grab King's collar. It was this action that caused him, too, to plunge downward, rolling in the swan's down blanket of snow to the bottom of the slope. Uh, you all right, fella? Yes, you warned me, didn't you, boy? Look what you got for your trouble. Well, get back up to the trail and keep looking till we... Uh, these tracks here. Somebody was standing here with a dog team. Was standing for quite a while, I'd say. It's possible to roll down that slope without being hurt. It might... Ah, oh, so that's it, boy. Hmm? Well. Sergeant Preston returned to Hankin City an hour later after having followed the tracks of the mysterious sled to the limits of the town, where they merged with others, making it impossible to mark them. The next day, he was thoughtful and alert, spending his time carefully patrolling the town. Mort Murdoch knew this as he talked to Clint Marsh in the back room of the trading post. I told you we'd make a monkey out of the Mountie. We have. The whole town's talking about the mystery robber. Everybody's asking Preston questions. And he just wishes he had the answers. <laughs> yeah, you were right. I never thought I'd live to see anybody get the best of them redcoats. Well, you have. What's more, if it wasn't for that bring your prisoner in alive rule that they've got, he could have nailed me last night. Yeah, you're lucky he didn't. Oh, don't worry. I know what I'm doing. Now, we'll wait till after the saloon closes tonight, Clint. You'll be at the usual place. And me, I'm going to walk out of there with as much dust as I can carry. Preston's guessing now, but he'll be talking to himself after three straight getaways in a row. It was long after midnight, and the Mountie, who walked quietly through the streets of Hankin City, had begun to think he'd waited in vain when he heard a distant gunshot. Hurrying through the snow, he was in time to see Mort Murdoch's dark figure running to his sled. Come on, King. We get the dogs up. Unless I'm mistaken, another robbery and perhaps another murder has been committed. And this time, we're going to upset some plans. Thirty minutes later, a dog team raced along the narrow trail high above the snow-covered slope. Marsh, you huskies, marsh! Make sure the folks... Here they are. Now to... in the shadows. <laughs> What's the matter, Clint? Getting so you won't stay in sight? You can't be seen from the trail. Come on, get those mutts up, will you? I want to get out of here before Preston comes by. You didn't make good enough time to get here before I came by. What? What? So you're the man who's responsible for three robberies and a murder. And maybe two after that gunshot in the saloon tonight. Wait a minute, huh? Your friend here is tied up. And this gun that's also pointing your way, Murdoch, caused him to be a little more quiet than usual. I couldn't help it, Mort. I was waiting here for you when he come up and took me by surprise. There was nothing I could do, I tell you. Uh, thanks to King, I made better time than you did, Murdoch. Now you're both going back to town. I don't have to tell you what'll be waiting for you when you get there. Thanks to you and your smart ideas, Mort, about making a monkey out of Preston, we're in this jam. Who is going to have who guess? Yeah. Yeah, you did a fine job. 
You were so much smarter than everybody else. Oh, shut up, will you? Never mind, Murdoch. He doesn't have much time to talk, and neither do you. You held a pretty good hand, but you overplayed it. Now, get moving, both of you. Yes, fella. The case is closed. These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit. All characters, names, places, and incidents used are fictitious. They are sent to you each week at this same time. Bob Height speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog king met that challenge, and justice ruled triumphant. A strong, ice-flecked wind drove itself like so many pinpoints against the small group of men standing together in front of the trading post in Hammerhead City. The great dog king stood close to his master, his long, bushy tail curled high above his lean, powerful body, his head turning briskly as he watched with bright eyes the sled skimming lightly over the snow-crusted street. There was vigor and stamina in this dog, whose name was as well known throughout the North Country as that of the man who owned him. But the trappers and prospectors standing around the Mountie weren't talking about King. Their attention was focused on a lead dog a few yards away, who was harnessed in line with some of the finest animals to ever pull a sled in the Yukon. There was an imperious lift to the lead dog's head, as if he were conscious of his superiority and impatient of having to wait for his master. Why, the finest team of dogs I've ever seen. Look at the line of them. You can have the rest of them. The lead's worth more than the whole team put together for my money. Say, McTavish. Yes? I can order that stuff for you if you want me to. Might take four or five days to get them through, though. Never mind ordering them. I don't want you to do no favors for me. All right, you huskies. Get set to travel. Smoke it, you miserable brute. How much? Much before I lash your hides open. Angus McTavish's sled pulled away from the trading post, and Sam Reardon, the owner of the post, stood in the doorway, his hands on his hips, looking after the dour Scotchman who lashed his dogs with such a heavy hand. Sergeant Preston and the men with him moved slowly toward the doorway. Hello there, Sam. Hi, Sergeant. Come on in. Well, old Angus's temper ain't sweetened up none, as you could see. He seemed to be in an unusually bad mood. I wanted to talk to him, too, but I thought the better of it. Better not to talk to him at all. It's something I have to do. His cabin's at an important place on the main trail. And travelers who've stopped there tell me he's refused them food and shelter. I wanted to see if I couldn't persuade him to cooperate. It's a bad thing when a man runs out of supplies on a trail. Uh, and... You're telling me. But the trails could be littered with corpses that died of starvation. For all that Scotchman cares. And I ought to know. I was caught short by his place once myself. I didn't know that, Sam. Well, I wouldn't have stopped his cabin anyway. But it was a bad storm. He sure didn't put out any welcome sign, I can tell you that. I remember him standing in the doorway. If the man starts out in the trail, he ought to know how long he'll be on it. It ain't my business if you miscalculated. I don't have many supplies myself. And what I have, I don't aim to give away. I'll pay for them, Angus. That ain't the point. I don't bother no one for anything. And I figure they can do likewise. Just what have you got against people? Ah, the more I see of people, the more I think of my dogs. They don't tell me no lies. I can depend on them. They don't ask any more than to be fed. And they work for what they eat. 
I got the best dogs in the Yukon. I got money in my pockets. And I don't need nothing from nobody. Best dogs in the Yukon, huh? You ever heard of Sergeant Preston's dog, King? Yes, yes, I've heard of that scurvy animal that follows the mountain around like some lap dog. I like my dogs with spirit, man. Without spirit, they ain't worth a thing. Yes, I take it you never seen, King. If I was you, I'd keep my mouth shut till you make sure of what you say. He ain't no lap dog. Well, I'm sorry I troubled you, McTavish. I won't do it again. See that you don't. There's nothing wrong with the folks up here, Sergeant. They ain't hard to get along with. If McTavish wants to be let alone, then we'll let him alone. But he's as good as committing murder when he refuses to help somebody that gets stuck on the trail. Well, he's right about his dogs. That's a fine lead he's got. What do you say about that, Sergeant? Well, he's got the size and the strength. And he looks like he's got the intelligence to be a good lead dog. But for some reason, I... You were uh, what? I don't know. I just wouldn't trust him. Well, what do you mean? Well, maybe it's a hunch. Maybe I'm completely wrong. But I think that dog's got a mean streak in him. He's wild at heart. Well, he's in harness against his will, and that whip's the only thing that keeps him there. Well, you saw how he started that sled out. He could pull three times his weight and never notice it. Oh, it's not his strength, I question, Bob. It's his loyalty. I'll wager that in a showdown, the only loyalty he'd recognize would be to himself. Well, you might be right, Sergeant. <laughs> if that's true, then him and his master are well matched. Yeah, I hope you're wrong about Angus, but I soon suppose I'll soon find out. Uh, why? I think the best place to talk to him would be at his cabin. Probably I'll have a tall job of persuasion on my hands if I do manage to convince him of his responsibility to help those travelers. Well, I sure wish you luck, Sergeant. And believe me, you'll need it. Sergeant Preston left the trading post, and as he and the great dog King walked down the street, the Mountie was silent. A high wind whipped at him mercilessly, forcing him to bend his head, bucking it. Angus McTavish had already left town, heading for his cabin, and the policeman debated the wisdom of following him. Speculatively, he looked at the sky. <laughs> well, King, there's a storm coming up. It'd be a real blizzard, I'm afraid. Still, if you set a good pace for the dogs, we'll be able to hold in. If not at Angus's place, we'll stop at Allison's. Come on, fella. We get the dogs started. A short time later, the Mountie sled was on the trail outside Hammerhead City. The great dog King led the pack, every muscle of his body quickening with a vitality that accepted consciously and vigorously the challenge thrown down by the elements. His master, too, had been used to long days and nights on Yukon trails. But as he looked again at the sky, his mind was filled with doubt. I don't know. Perhaps it would have been wiser to have stayed in town. But for some reason, I can't help feeling it's better we left. Well, no matter. I'm King! I'm you, Malamute! <laughs> ahead of the Mountie, Angus McTavish drove his dogs hard as the wind increased its fury, lashing his hardened body so that he felt its bite even through his heavy Mackinac and parka. True, the Scotsman had a good team of dogs, and a leader whom he believed had no equal in the Yukon. There was no reason why he shouldn't make it to his cabin before the blizzard really set its teeth into the North Country. Smokey! Smokey, get those dogs moving, you hear me? Mush! The lead dog bent his head, obstinately slowing his pace, the rest of the team taking their cue from him. Smokey knew from an instinct that was as old as the weather itself that the blizzard was nearly upon him. His intention was to curl up in the snow, cover his nose with his tail, and stay there until the storm had worn itself out. But Angus had no such thought. His whip cut the air ruthlessly, descending again and again. With glowering eyes, the lead dog turned and looked at his master. It was one will pulling against another. Smokey, I'll kill you before you disobey me. Kill you, you hear? Get up, you stubborn, scurvy brute. Get up and pull them dogs. The 
minute, the pass slowly while McCarvey stood flogging his dogs were electric with the clash of two powerful personalities. Angus held a whip hand. Because of this, Smokey pulled himself to his feet. A surly, menacing growl in his throat. Now, mush, you miserable hound! Mush! The snow sifted through the air lightly at first. Small dry flakes, eddying and whirling, driven by the wind. Again and again, McTavish brushed them from before his eyes in order to see the trail. I, and I was a fool to try to beat this storm. But I'll save time by crossing the creek and going that way. Ought to be frozen over. Mush, you malamutes! Mush! McTavish stopped his dogs at the creek and then went forward on foot to test the ice. He was far too cautious to risk his team to ice which may not have been thick enough to hold them. As he walked to the edge of the creek, the man slipped. In a moment, he was down. And in that one moment, the dog Smokey, with a savage growl and bared teeth, lunged forward. Still in harness, he dragged the others after him. A madness seized the pack. McTavish raised himself on one elbow to look into two gleaming eyes, alive and glowing with a vindictive hatred. He felt in one terrible instant the warm, panting breath. Oh, Smokey... Smokey, you brute! Stay back! Back in here! Ah! McTavish was conscious of a sudden sickening realization. He knew with a blinding sureness that the dog would kill him. And for the first time since he left his boyhood home in Scotland, a desperate cry came involuntarily from his lips. Help! Help! The wind blowing toward King and Sergeant Preston's team brought Angus' call for help to the great dog's ears. King heard, too, the cries of the frenzied dog team. And almost like a streak of lightning, the great Malamute raced through the snow, his paws barely touching it. His head in the air, following the scent, the wind held to guide him. Oh, oh Smokey! No, 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 Smokey! As King saw the dog team, he caught the unmistakable scent of human blood. He knew it was only a matter of seconds until the wild lead dog would finish what he had begun. McTavish saw the dogs through fear-glazed eyes. This powerfully built Malamute had come from nowhere. Could it be that this dog would fight Smokey? Fight for the prize that would be Angus McTavish? Weakly, the man closed his eyes, not daring to think. Feverishly, Smokey turned on King. Somehow, the wily animal had slipped from the harness that had held him. The two dogs were on equal terms, and then they were at each other's throats, parrying, thrusting, gleaming, death-dealing fangs, the weapons that found their mark, tearing fur from flesh. Dodging and lunging, they battled. Smokey fought cunningly. But it was a battle in which stamina as well as strength was involved. And by the time Preston arrived at the edge of the creek, he found Smokey panting and motionless in the snow. Slowly, McTavish had crawled to his sled, where he pulled himself up to grasp his revolver. Are you all right? I... I'm all right. That's your dog. Yes, what about Smokey? There he is, lying in his own blood. Is he dead? No, no, your dog didn't kill him. But I'm going to do that now. <laughs> He would have killed me. Angus, here, let me help you. We're not far from Allison's cabin. Come on, you'll be taken care of there. It was a short time later. Angus McTavy sat beside the warmth of Tom Allison's fireplace... And from his chair, he looked admiringly at the magnificent Malamute at Sergeant Preston's feet. He's a great dog, Sergeant. Aye, the best that ever was. Yes, he is. At least that's always been my thought. Man, it's anybody's thought. And Angus McTavish isn't one to deny the truth when he sees it. That dog not only saved my life, he taught me a lesson, too. You can't live without extending a helping hand to the other fellow when he has the need of it. Now, what would I have done if... Uh, Sergeant, how much do you want for him? Name any price, man. I'll give you my word. He'll never taste the whip neither like them ugly curs of mine. Uh, any price. I I'll pay in cash. Here, now. As if he understood the Scotchman's words, King raised his head to look at his master. And between Preston and the dog was a look of complete understanding. To measure the dog's devotion to his master would have been impossible. It was boundless, 
and as constant as the heart that beat within him. Sell King? Angus, there isn't enough money in the world to buy him. <laughs> yes, fellow, I think everything's going to be all right. These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit, and all characters, names, places, and incidents used are fictitious. They're sent to you each week at the same time. Jack McCarthy speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. I'm King. I'm you Husky. <laughs> The Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his Wonder Dog King met that challenge. And justice ruled triumphant. In a small, garishly furnished walk-up apartment on a nondescript Seattle street, two men sat talking. Blackie Lewis was the older of the two. And his face wore an expression of impatience as he glanced from the cards he was cutting with practiced fingers. I tell you, Blackie, there's not a thing I can do about it. He won't change his mind. You said that before. You've been getting your cut on everything. It's easy money, kid. Well, sure, sure it is. Or was. Because I'm going with him. Look, what's got into you anyway? You going sentimental? So the two of you have stuck together all this time. You're orphans, ain't you? Both you and him have made your own way. You don't know that sap a thing. Don't call Eddie a sap, Blackie. Maybe he doesn't see a lot of things the way I do, but he's not dumb, see? You think that stuff in the newspaper is on the level? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, sure I do. They brought a ton of the real McCoy in on that boat, didn't they? Just think, Blackie. A ton of gold. Mm. I am thinking... I never heard of the place before, but there's no reason why we couldn't... Hmm. Couldn't what? Yeah, maybe I was wrong. Things haven't been so good here lately. The last brush I had with the law was a little too close. I don't get what you're driving at. Let me see that paper. Hmm. Hmm. How soon are you two leaving? Oh, not for a couple of weeks. Three at the most. Why, kid? I'm going to meet you there. Let's see. Yeah, I'll meet you in Dawson. Yukon Territory. Several months passed. That Inspector Maynard's office at headquarters of the Northwest Mounted Police, Sergeant Preston stood in front of a map of the territory, listening to his superior officer. Unfortunately, we have only the description of the robbers which the bank clerk supplied before he died. Now, that won't be a great deal of help to you since the bandits wore bandanas over their faces. Here you are. Hmm, you're right. Doesn't say much. All you can get out of this is that there were two men. Yes. If they're responsible for all of this murder and robbery, they've got quite a score behind them. It's your job to see that they settle their score. Whatever it is, Sergeant. I'll start to work on it immediately, sir. Uh, you think you'll need any assistance on the case? Well, King and I yeah, usually... That's right, uh, I forgot for the moment. King's your assistant, eh? I never did understand that. But handle this any way you like. Just so as those men are brought to justice. Good luck. Thank you, sir. I hope I won't need it. Thus began many days on the trail for Sergeant Preston and the great dog King. They stopped at the towns where the crimes had been committed pausing only long enough for the Monty to ask questions and then move on. The trail ended abruptly at Burgess City. While the policeman made that settlement his temporary headquarters, 
he searched painstakingly for clues of the two men he sought. Meantime, at a small cabin several miles north of the sprawling boom town, Edward Warner knelt on the floor in front of Kathy Merrill to unfasten the thongs on her snowshoes. I'm awfully glad I met you on the trail, Kathy. I don't often have the pleasure of walking with you. Well, good heavens. I think that's more words than you've said to me since the day I met you. Well, I, I've been meaning to tell you how grateful Johnny and I are to you. I mean your father, for the way he's been to us. Oh, nonsense. Father likes you. Otherwise, he wouldn't have told you about that strip of land next to ours. He staked a claim on this property that's really very worthwhile. But he thinks you two will make a strike on your land that may be every bit as good. Well, I hope he's right. Only it's Johnny he likes. Johnny's a great guy. You know, I've known him since we were kids. Why, I, I Honestly, remember... Honestly, Eddie, don't you ever talk about yourself? Huh? <laughs> well, there isn't much to tell about me, but... Oh, then... Eddie. Oh, what's wrong? Nothing, nothing at all. Guess the wall of Jericho would have to fall down in front of you before you'd see what I... Oh, never mind. As Eddie Warner walked from Merrill's cabin toward his own, Kathy watched him from the window with an exasperated frown on her face that softened to a smile. Bending his head against the wind, Eddie was haunted by a mental picture of the girl, her hair, her eyes, the timber of her voice. He shook his head and walked faster. Later that evening in Burgess City, Johnny Patterson stood at the bar in the Golden Nugget Cafe. Blackie Lewis was beside him. But the younger man looked morosely at the contents in the glass he held instead of listening to his companion. So, while I was playing poker this afternoon, they told me about the mountain in town. Seems like he's... Say, what's eating you anyway? Blackie, my trigger finger's getting itchy again. Oh, so that's it, huh? And <laughs> hey, what's the deal? You know Merrill? Sure. He's the one that tipped you off to the land out there, isn't he? Yeah. Well, so far, we ain't turned up much gold, though. But he's got more of it in that mine of his than you or me ever saw before. Yeah. We could move in on that. What about this cow of yours? You'd have a hard time pulling anything with him around. The money's in town, isn't he? So, if it had looked like Eddie was the one who killed Merrill... You mean frame him? Hey, why did sudden change your heart? I thought you and him... Are... I get it. You get what? Listen, kid. Don't try to fool me. I've been around a long time. There's only one thing that can bust up a friendship between two men, and that's a woman. So, well... <laughs> He's jealous of him, huh? Jealous? <laughs> He's too dumb to open his mouth. That don't seem to make any difference to her. Anytime the three of us are together, it's him she listens to. When she can get him to talk. No, I'm not jealous. Just, just clearing away the office. That's all. all right, you can count me in. Yeah, but there's one thing, kid. With the money in town, I'm a little leery of keeping them money bags and posts at the hotel. Can you take my share and keep it with yours till he clears out? Sure, I'll take it back with me. What about your pal? Any danger of him finding us? Don't worry. I've got it hid where he'll never think a look at. Besides, we won't have him to consider much longer. Now, you come up to the cabin with me tonight. The two of us will work on a plan. I've already got an idea, but I'll need you to back me up. So come on, let's not waste time. It was mid-afternoon of the next day. A light snow fell. And inside Merrill's cabin, Johnny Patterson leaned back in his chair to look at the old man, who was examining some samples of ore. So uh, Kathy went in to get the supplies. I told her she better not waste any time getting back here. You never know when these light snows will turn fierce. That's right. I've been mighty happy since you came up here, my boy. It's company for both Kathy and me. It used to be pretty lonely. Yeah. But it's more pleasant now. And I wish you all the luck in the world with you. Johnny. Johnny. This we've always loaded, Mr. Merrill. Johnny, have you lost your mind? What's the meaning of this? Put down that gun. I... Not before I put one of these slugs right through your heart, old timer. You, you must be insane. Johnny, please listen to reason. It was much later that night. And in the cabin where Johnny Patterson and Edward Warner made their home, 
Sergeant Preston looked from the two young men to Blackie Lewis, finally at Kathy Merrill. The girl's face was white, her eyes red from weeping, but she sat straight and still, making an effort to control her sorrow. King lay on the floor, his head resting between his paws while he watched the proceedings alertly. This bullet was fired from a revolver that belonged to you, Warner? Yes, the revolver is mine, but I didn't have it with me today. I went hunting and took Johnny's rifle. Johnny Patterson shot a quick glance at Eddie. It seemed to say so much. It seemed to say, so you want him to believe you were out hunting? All right, I'll back you up. Preston noticed the look and turned to Johnny. He took your rifle? Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. He, he took the rifle, Sergeant. And you? Uh, Blackie and I tried to do some work on the claim today. The snow came up, so we quit and we came inside. Spent the afternoon playing two-handed poker, as a matter of fact. I see. You didn't go to Merrill's cabin at all today. I guess it's my fault that we didn't, Sergeant. I was pretty anxious to see this claim Johnny told me about. King turned his attention from the small group in front of him and looked instead at a corner of the room. His eyes were cocked forward eagerly as he raised his head. Well, Patterson, seems you have someone to back up your alibi. Now, what time did your friend leave to go hunting? Why, uh, uh, well, I don't exactly remember. But he did go hunting. Uh, Warner, you were alone most of the day. With the snow to cover your tracks, it would be impossible to determine whether or not you went to Mr. Merrill's cabin. Now, the fact remains that you went hunting, but you didn't bring anything in. I'm afraid I'll have to put you under arrest. Arrest? Yes, for investigation of murder. Say, listen, what's that noise? Well, I don't know. Sounds like a scraping of some sort. Probably a rat, Mr. Lewis. We were troubled with a few of them at the cabin until Dad got rid of them with traps. <laughs> It looks like King discovered the rat. Sergeant Preston turned a glance at King, and from the corner of his eyes, he saw one of the floorboards on which the dog had placed the weight of his front paws went down. And then, bang, this King leaped back with amazing agility. Come on, get away from there. Sergeant, call him over here. That uh, fine dog like that shouldn't be chasing rats. Oh, wait a minute. That's a loose floorboard. You ought to nail that down, Patterson. You could twist your ankle pretty badly stepping on the... Well, I'll fix it, Sergeant. There's no need for you to... Johnny Patterson left the sentence unfinished, for he saw the Mountie reach into the cavity in the floor, and quickly he reached for a revolver, swinging around to cover the occupants of the room. King had not seen, but he'd sensed the action, and he turned looking at the man, waiting tensely for some sign from Preston. You can drop what you got in your hand, Sergeant. So, money bags from the bank in Southboro. Yeah. And a lot more pokes in there without names on them. They ain't gonna do you any good. It's too bad that dog of yours got nosy. Get his gun, Blackie. Johnny. Johnny, you mean you've had those there all this time? With the murders you've got behind you, Patterson, I guess one more wouldn't make any difference to you. And your guess would be right, too. Sure, I killed Merrill. Blackie and me was gonna move in on the claim. I figured I'd marry Kathy once Eddie was out of the way. Marry you? Will you murder her? I now don't be so hasty, baby, because you're going with me. I'm going to kill you, Sergeant. And you too, Eddie. By the time you're found, Blackie and me will be out of the Yukon. I won't go a step with you, not a step. You've got everything pretty neatly planned out, Patterson. There's just one thing you've overlooked. Yeah, what's that? The same dog who uncovered your loot. Eddie King! Oh, that dog away! Oh, maybe I'm handcuffed. Get him away! Get him away! Oh. Oh. Try to break out of that hole, Lewis. Now drop that gun, Patterson. Drop that gun. Get oh, my arm off. Oh. Get that dog away from my ankle. Get him away. All right, King. Now, oh. you're under arrest, both of you. You unlock those handcuffs, will you, Miss Merrill? Here's the key. I certainly will. Oh, Eddie, I'm so glad. I, I couldn't believe you'd done it. You never opened your mouth to say you didn't. <laughs> I couldn't believe myself when I saw Johnny didn't believe me. He put on a good act, Eddie. Pretending anxiety to back up your story, and at the same time tearing it apart with the tone of his voice. Eddie. Eddie, won't you ever say it? Won't you ever ask me? Why, I... Kathy. And now, Patterson, you and Blackie are headed for jail. But you can take it from me. You won't stay there long. You've both got an appointment with a hangman. Yes, fella. Thanks to you, the case is closed.
These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit. All characters, names, places, and incidents used are fictitious. They are sent to you each week at this same time. Bob Height speaking. This program came to you from our transcription studios. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. The Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog King met that challenge, and justice ruled triumphant. There were many courageous men and women who settled the western United States, homesteaders, cattlemen, empire builders, but there was a lawless element, too. Men who'd commit murder for a price or because killing was in their blood. Manny Richards was one of these. He was just a youngster when, with a handful of hard-bitten frontiersmen, he stood off an Indian attack at Adobe City. <laughs> Looks like I've fallen back, Jim. Yeah. Better take a look around. How many of our men they get? Luke's down. Benson. Taylor. Say, hey, look at the kid, would you? Yeah, he's mighty handy with a rifle. I'll say that for him. What's he blinking for? Huh? That eye of his. Look. He's fattened like he had something in it. Uh, maybe it's nerves. Nerves? He holds that rifle with a steady hand. Hey, the Redskins are going to rush us again. Manny Richards was mighty handy with a rifle or a six-gun. And the episode at Adobe City was the beginning of a career during which neither of these weapons were out of his hands for long. Few sheriffs in the West remained in office long. A number of those who didn't died because they tried to stop the Larry Wells gang. In the Wolf Shed Saloon in Flintlock in 1892. Put that bottle down there, Barky. Yeah, that's right. Hey, just heard something that might interest you, Larry. Yeah? What is it? Sheriff says he's coming down here and he's going to give us ten minutes to get out of town. Here, yeah, have a drink. Yeah. You like it here, Manny? Uh, hold it. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, so do I. <laughs> here comes that badge coder now. You want me to take care of this? <laughs> With that blinking eye you got? <laughs> nah. The sheriff will think you're winking at him. Well, that's me. I'm giving you boys just ten minutes to get out of town. We kind of like your town, Sheriff. Fact is, we aim to stay here a spell. I've warned you. That's all I need. Several years passed. One by one, Wells' followers had been killed until only the leader himself and Manny Richards remained. Two men sat alone in a cabin isolated in the hills. From force of habit, both men sat with their backs to a corner of a room, facing the only window in the building and the bolted door. Turn that lamp down a bit, will you, Larry? Huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. How long do you plan to stay holed up in here? Till I'll figure out what I'm going to do next. Head for the border, I guess. Well, you can count me out on this deal. <laughs> What's the matter? You ain't yellow now, are you? Me? Oh, maybe that's what you'd call it. 
But when the law gets as close as it is, maybe it's smart to know when you're licked. In other words, them guns of yours were for hire just as long as you only had a two-bit sheriff to worry about, huh? Eh? Eh, maybe. I'm not dying with any bullet in my back, Larry. That's what's waiting for you unless you clear out of the country. I'll clear out, all right. But it won't be for long. What about you? It'd be smart for you to get out to the border, too, you know. Well, I'm going to turn prospector. Prospector? <laughs> Well, you're going up and up. Uh, that's a good one. <laughs> Maybe you ain't been keeping up the news lately. I have. Gold's been discovered in the Yukon Territory, Larry. And that's where I'm going. It's wide open. Stay up there a while and see just how my luck is. I didn't know you'd better. I'd see you'd lost your nerve. I ain't lost anything. I'm getting out of the country, that's all. Get a start where nobody knows me. I wish you luck. <laughs> Richards went to the Yukon, where after several months he staked a claim. He felt secure in the knowledge that he was safe in a country where no one knew him. Until one day he met the man whose cabin and claim adjoined his own. In that cabin, Julie Ferguson cleared the dishes from the table, while her father sat smoking his pipe, gazing steadily into the fire. Goodness, Dad, you look as if you're thousands of miles away. What's wrong? Well, I guess I am thousands of miles away, Julie. I was thinking. What's your opinion of Richards? Oh, I don't know. Seems quiet enough. There's something about him that's like a panther or some cunning animal. Always has his guard on. Yes, that's it. Those eyes of his. I suppose it's just a nervous habit, but his constant blinking... Blinking? Blink. That's it, Julie, that's it. Whatever are you talking about? When you go into town for surprise tomorrow, I want you to leave word there for Sergeant Preston to come out here. Sergeant Preston? But why? What's all this got to do with Mr. Richards? Maybe it's got a lot to do with him. I'll write a note for Preston tonight. All I want you to do is take it into town. But Richards mustn't know anything about it. If he did, it might be dangerous for both of us, Julie. <laughs> next day, when John Ferguson carried the scraps of leftover food from his cabin, he walked several yards toward the edge of a birch forest. Here, he overturned the basket. And as he did, a huge black bear lumbered forward. These bears were the scavengers of the north. Go on, get out of the way. There were several of those slow-moving animals in the vicinity. Ferguson had grown as used to them as they had to him. The man glanced for a moment to the small cabin on the land bordering his own, unaware that Manny Richards watched him from a window. And so the days passed. There was a tension in the air. Richards and Ferguson avoided each other, and the elderly prospector suspected the reason for Manny Richards' increased worry. Goodness! Isn't that a rifle, Dad? Yes, sir. Uh, Richards must be doing some hunting. The sound certainly carries in the stillness, doesn't it? Yeah, he's been doing a lot of hunting these last couple of days. Julie, are you sure they didn't tell you exactly when Sergeant Preston would be in when you were in town? Oh, nobody knew exactly. Except that he's due in either today or tomorrow. Oh, I do wish you'd tell me what's worrying you. Ain't nothing at all. Now, don't you trouble your head none about it. <laughs> well, I'll take that rubbish out for you. Them bears will be beating the door down unless there's some food out there for them to nibble at <laughs> Be right back, Julie. John Ferguson walked slowly, his head bent against the wind. If he heard the bear coming from the timber, he thought nothing of it, but continued walking. The animal snarled, voicing the inarticulate sounds of the wilderness. It was the Ferguson, then looked up to meet glowing eyes and bared teeth as the animal moved awkwardly toward him. The air was full of the savage growl coming from the bear's throat. King and Sergeant Preston heard those sounds as they approached the cabin. The Mountie, turning, ran to his sled for a rifle. But the great Malamute, sensing Ferguson's danger, raced forward to the animal whose giant forepaw was at that moment raised, ready to strike a blow that would have knocked the elderly prospector unconscious had it hit him. 
instead. And now when you approach, the bear turns, drawing himself off balance. Carrying the animal by running circles around him, diverting his attention while John Ferguson ran wildly toward his cabin. He paused and lunged, struggling, backing away, nipping the hind paws and escaping narrowly from his distracting forepaws. It was then as a curious and panting bear made one desperate plunge toward him that Preston began firing. in front of him. King. King, old boy. Oh. Thank heaven you're all right. Sergeant, I'll never be able to thank you. Your dog saved my life. Uh, good work, King, old fella. I don't understand all this. These bears have always been very quiet. I was used to them. They'd make their way here and eat the scraps from our table. Then today, for no reason in the world, this one attacked me. Uh, you're fortunate we haven't along when we did. But it's all over now, John. I got your note, and that's why I come out here right away. Now, tell me, where does this man live? In that cabin there. You know, this bear has a magnificent tilt. I'm going to have it. Every time I look at it, I'll remember my narrow escape. You have a knife, Sergeant? Yeah, sure. Here you are. You know, that's very odd. Strange that an animal should attack you if, as you say, you've grown used to each other. Some reason for... Uh, John, here. Let me examine that card. Boy, what's wrong, Sergeant? Now, look, see here. You notice the pelt? Yeah. Someone was firing at this there. Firing what looks to me like a... Yeah. Yes, it is. A twenty-two. But you'd never kill one of these bears with a twenty-two. Man might as well use a slingshot. I'm not so sure it wouldn't serve the same purpose as a slingshot. It would irritate the animal and madden it to the point where it would attack the first man to cross its path. Then you mean... Yes. It? Somebody made an attempt on your life by using this bear, John. Come on. We're going over to this man's cabin. As the two men walked across the clearing, King followed his master. For a moment, he doubted his ears when he heard what was apparently a repetition of the incident that had occurred but a few minutes before. Stay back. Get away from me, you dumb... Another vicious bear. Shoot, Sergeant. There he goes. You've got him, Sergeant. Too late, I'm afraid. Richard is dead. That bear broke his neck. Two on the same day. Surely all of these animals here can. Ah. Same thing, I see. The hide's been peppered with bullets from a twenty-two. I don't understand all this. There's his sled all packed. Seems to me like Richards was leaving his cabin and... Then he was stopped. From the description I have, that's Manny Richards, all right. I had no idea he was in the territory. Well, you haven't been up this way for a long time. I thought there was something familiar about him. When my daughter called my attention to those blinking eyes of his, I remembered that I'd seen him with his partner, Larry Wells, when a sheriff got killed in Flintlock back in the USA. And he hasn't changed much since then. But what I don't get is why he'd anger two bears. Well, he probably knew you'd recognized him, John. He was anxious to get you out of the way without being labeled a murderer. He thought of a very clever scheme, but it boomeranged on him. It sure did. You know, John, his eyes might have been responsible for his death. Uh, how do you figure? Well, there was a glare on the snow to contend with besides his eyes. As you remarked, it was strange that more than one bear should have been angered. Or possibly he meant to provoke only one. Certainly that's all that was needed for his purpose. But he made a mistake. Both bears looked exactly alike to him. Well, he sure paid for it. None of them owl hoots came to a good end. But I don't envy Manny Richards for the way he died. <laughs> yes, King. The case is closed. <laughs> These 
copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit and are sent to you each week at this same time. All characters, names, places, and incidents used are fictitious. Bob Height speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. One, two, three, the Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog king met that challenge, and justice ruled triumphant. Sergeant Preston and the great dog king traveled the snow-covered trail to Melville, the lean, powerfully built Malamute racing far ahead of his master's dog team. As he stood on the runners of his sled, the Monty saw King pause in his tracks to nuzzle the snow, then wait, <laughs> motionlessly. <laughs> ho, you Malamute, ho! <laughs> uh, what is it, hmm? Well, looks like this man took a bad beating. Wait till I see if... I never saw him before. Young chap, barely breathing. There's a bullet wound and a nasty cut on his forehead. Yeah, we'll have to get him into town and fast. Whoever threw him off the trail left him for dead. It looks like he's not far from it either. Even as the scarlet-coated policeman carried the unconscious man to his sled, two men were on the trail from Melville to a trading post north of the settlement. One of them sat in the sled, while the other rode the runners, his cold, narrow eyes on the dogs ahead of him as he spoke. You got it all ready so you can say whatever's needed? Yeah, sure. That young punk did enough talking on the boat to cover everything. I know his life story backwards and forwards. From what he said about the old man, the old fellow ought to be up in years now. It won't be hard to pull the wool over his eyes. Well, just be sure you answer the name of Lance Peters from now on. First couple of times, it might seem obvious, so be careful. And remember, we're in this together. As soon as the old gent lets you know where this strike of his is located, you get rid of him. From there on... It'll be ours. It's quite of you to let me handle the toughest part of this job. What are you complaining about? I got the kid out of the way, didn't I? You look more like him than I do. I'll leave you off the trading post. From there, you're on your own. You know where to find me. Don't worry, pal. You'll hear from me. At a small trading post that was the meeting place for trappers and prospectors for miles around, a group of men sat around an old iron stove that glowed cherry red. The expressions on their faces were of amusement, disgust, and interest as they listened to an old-timer whose merry blue eyes turned serious as he spoke. Yes, sir. I've lived through all kinds of weather. One year here, it was so cold, I fired my rifle and the bullet froze before it could leave it. <laughs> <laughs> You're the limit, Mac. You mean you don't believe me? Believe you? <laughs> Your stories is all alike, except that one stands higher than the other. Say, what about that nephew of yours you say is coming up here to work the gold mine you say you found? Yeah, what about that? If you sure enough found one, seems like you could let your old friends in on where it is. Well, shucks, I've already showed you a chunk of gold that got out of the ground. And when he gets here, we're working it together. And I ain't telling nobody but him where it is, neither. We're going to be two of the richest men on earth. Yep. He's all the folks I got now. Yeah, it's a fine thing. And he couldn't even tell us what he looked like. See, I wouldn't put it past you to get somebody up here to pretend he's your nephew. Just to make the story good. Oh, why don't you say he ain't found nothing? Well, consign your hungry hides. I already told you I ain't seen the boy since he was knee-high to a beaver. How could I tell you what he looks like? Now that his mother's dead, he's going to live here with me. Me? I believe it when I see him. Yeah, you two are suspicious sons of guns. Always doubting a man. But you'll live to eat your words, and by golly, I'm going to make certain you do. 
Well, I guess I'll get back to the cabin. But remember what I said. You learn not to doubt McGregor. <laughs> <laughs> Next day at the trading post, Sergeant Preston measured the expression on McGregor's face, which seemed, for the first time since the mob had known the old storyteller, to sag tiredly. You were going to be stopping here long, Sergeant? No, I'm afraid not. Well, we're mighty glad to see you anyway. By the way, Mac, uh, what are we going to see that nephew of yours? Yes, sir. What about that, Mac? <laughs> I don't know why you fellas are so dang impatient. He ain't your nephew. Huh. Takes a long time to come up from the States. I say, there was a young fella in here yesterday, late, asking the way to your cabin. Yeah? Didn't say who he was, though. Well, I guess I'll be going. I got a lot to do. Well, what's your hurry? No stories today? Huh? Stories. You know, them hoppers you're always telling. Never know you'd let a day go by before without adding to that score that you're going to have to settle up when you get to the other side of the Great Divide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go again. Never taken a man serious. Oh, just a minute, Mac. I'll go with you. Oh, all right, Sergeant. Shalom, boys. Bye, Mac. Come on, King, old boy. Goodbye, Sam. Right back again, Sergeant. I'll do that. Uh, you plan to come out to the cabin, Sergeant? Well, I might stop by later in the afternoon, Mac. I expect to be up near the rapids. Uh-huh. When are you going to start working that strike I hear you located? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, oh, come on, Sergeant. I... Guess a man has got to talk to somebody, and if you don't mind listening to me, I'd like well, to. Well, I don't you. mind, Mac. You know that. Well, the truth of the matter is, Sergeant, my nephew is here. Well, that's fine. Yeah, sure it is. Only when a man ain't seen his nephew for as long as I ain't seen mine, he shouldn't spend so much time wind jamming about it. I mean, uh, oh, well, I've set quite a store by the boy, seeing as how I don't have a son of my own. He. Well, he ain't just what I expected Sarah's son to be like. It'll take you a while to get used to having a nephew around, Mac. Sure, sure. That's that's what I mean. Not that I don't want any of them friends of mine at the post to know it, you understand, Sergeant. It, it's just uh, just that I want to kind of get used to the boy myself first. Well, don't worry. You can trust me not to mention him. And now that he's here, you'll spend most of your time prospecting, won't you? Well, I aim to show him the location this afternoon. Well, then we may see you later. Get the dogs up, King. Yeah, why is well travel, I guess? Sergeant Preston was silent as his team pulled along the snow covered trail. He thought of McGregor's nephew and the old man's dispirited attitude. But the unconscious young man he'd found along the trail still concerned the Mountie and he turned toward the village of a neighboring Indian tribe where he planned to question the chief. However, his query shed no light on the mysterious traveler who'd been left without identification. It was late afternoon when he turned his team toward McGregor's cabin, following the trail beside Blackstone Creek. Meanwhile, several miles up the creek, where a ledge jutted over a stretch of treacherous rapids, McGregor stood talking to the man who masqueraded as his nephew. Trail over here, lads! And there's more gold in this here ground than you and me has ever seen before. Sure is a lucky break for me. Yeah, and it's all ours. Wait a minute, old-timer. It's not ours. It's mine. What'd you say? I said it's mine. All mine. Lance, that gun. Have you lost your senses? It ain't nothing, Lance, Grandpa. It's George Thompson. But that ain't gonna make any difference to you. Then, then you're not my... Ah, I'm not your nephew. I came up here on the steamer city of Seattle with your real nephew. He told me all about you and the strike of yours. Too bad for him that he couldn't keep his mouth shut. But Lance, where's Lance? Dead, somewhere on the trail from Seahorse to Melville. There won't be anybody who'll ever know who he was because I took his papers and identification. You, you killed him. That's right, old-timer, and you're going to get a dose of the same medicine. Well, you wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare I... pull a murder, but this ain't going to look like a murder. Talk you with the butt of this revolver and toss you over the raft. I can't stop you. You've already committed one murder, but you won't get away with this, you... Uh, Wait, no. <laughs> Sergeant Preston's dog team rounded a curve in the trail just in time to see the man push McGregor into the rushing waters. In the space of a minute, the Monty had the imposter covered with his gun, but he looked helplessly toward the water where Mac was caught in the current. 
The iciness of the water had revived the old man. Though weighted by his mackinaw, he was powerless. The spray from the rapids rose slightly beyond him. It was a mad swirl of water, a horrible death trap. Sergeant Preston looked from his prisoner to the ledge, where King was poised for an instant. You don't have a thing on me, Mally. Hanging's the penalty for murder in this country. Yeah? What are you going to do about the old man? You can throw him a rope and save him. The policeman knew the man in front of him was weighing the chances of escape. It was then King hit the icy water. He was caught in the current, but he fought it, struggling to reach the man who was frantically trying to keep afloat. King swam toward him, the water chopping, pulling, tearing against his body. But the powerful muscles surged through it, turning him to the middle of the water that seemed possessed of a demon. The great Malamute felt the impact as McGregor was helplessly thrown against him. Weakly, the man flung both arms about the great dog's neck. (laughs) Then King turned and drained every ounce of his strength to pull his burden to safety. Uh, Good boy, King. Come on now. Here, boy. Here. I got him. It was a panting but triumphant dog who lay five minutes later at his master's feet, while McGregor huddled shivering in blankets. George Thompson turned cold eyes to the dog and to the man he'd attempted to murder. Late the next day, Sergeant Preston and the great dog King were at McGregor's cabin, where the men from the trading post sat around the bunk where Lance Peters rested against pillows. A broad grin was on his bandaged face as they watched his uncle sip a steaming cup of tea. Yes, sir. By golly, after that cold swim I had yesterday, I can't drink enough hot tea. Swim, he calls it, Sergeant. I'm thinking it was that dog of yours that had to swim. And you should have seen him swimming, too. Only a Hercules could have made out in that current, I can tell you. Hercules is king, I guess. Yes, he did a grand job. Both you and Lance are safe, Mac. Yeah, and both of us owing our safety to you. Well, after you told me what Thompson had said before he threw you into the creek, I knew immediately who Lance was. Yes, it's too bad I wasn't conscious to tell you. I could have saved you a lot of trouble, Sergeant. Uh, you took a pretty bad beating. Well, beat up or not, he sure looks better to me than that shifty-eyed crook that was posing at him. Oh, I'm telling you, my boy, when I saw him, I was mighty disappointed in what I thought was my nephew. You got the fellow who was working with Thompson, too, didn't you, Sergeant? Yes, they're both behind bars. Yes, and I'll bet if I told this story to the bunch of you, none of you would have believed it, would you? Well, now, Mac, I wouldn't say that. But... Oh, no, you wouldn't. Well, you would if you hadn't have got it word for word from the sergeant himself. Huh. Maybe from now on you won't be so ready to doubt me. <laughs> you uh, you have told some things that was uh, pretty hard to believe, Mac. Uh, not that we didn't believe you, understand. But, uh, well, it looks like this is on the level and you've got a mighty fine nephew. Yes, sir. <laughs> you see, I told you I'd make you eat your words. Oh, oh. Uh, what's wrong, Mac? Oh, I was just thinking, sergeant. If it wasn't for King here... I wouldn't be able to... Oh. I guess maybe I shouldn't do so much talking, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, fellow. Everything here is going to be all right. These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit. All characters, names, places, and incidents used are fictitious. They are sent to you each week at this same time and originate in our transcription studios. Bob Height speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network.